getting this. I'm getting this, you guys. So far, so good. All right, so it's all yours. All right, I'm just going to jump right in and I'll be around all day if people have questions or whatever in the chat, just let me know. Um, I'm here today to talk about facilitated communication and it's a technique that's been thoroughly debunked by the scientific community, but still being used on people with severe communication difficulties associated with autism, cerebral palsy, developmental delays and other disabilities. Uh, the technique was popularized by Rosemary Crosley of Australia and Douglas Bicklin at Syracuse University in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And the promise of FC is that by simply providing emotional and physical support to the person with disabilities, as well as verbal and physical cueing, a facilitator can help the individual unlock language and literacy skills, presumably learned th through osmosis by having books or newspapers around them in their environment. Proponents claim the messages obtained using FC are quote unquote independent, while critics of the technique have demonstrated repeatedly in controlled settings that it's the facilitator and not the person with disabilities writing the messages. By 1994-95, FC was completely discredited because of the high degree of facilitator control over FC authored messages, actually 100% in controlled settings. But the technique is still being used today by proponents who are unwilling to accept the scientific evidence or refuse to provide reliable proof of their claims. Um, here in this picture, the facilitator is supporting the student at the wrist during the typing session. Many facilitators start this way, though um, support is also given at the elbow, shoulder, back, leg, and other parts of their clothing. I'll show you um, some examples of those in a moment. FC sparked the imaginations of parents and educators across the United States when in 1990, Bicklin published an article called Communication Unbound in the Harvard Review. The technique was easy to implement, required no more than a printed letter board to work and an ability by facilitators to provide a positive experience for their client or loved one. Proponents bypassed the rigorous scientific uh, study of FC and went directly to the public. They found credulous reporters to document success stories in local newspapers, which they in turn used as quote unquote evidence in their university sponsored workshops to prove that FC was already being used with the general public. They, um, there was and still is no licensing or oversight requirements from reputable organizations like ASHA to be a facilitator. And the lure of FC is that the results are quick, especially compared with existing evidence-based communication techniques that sometimes require expensive equipment and costly implementation by licensed professionals. Reports claim that tens of thousands of people came believe, became believers in FC, though I'd be curious to know how many of those first wave facilitators still use FC, given that it remains unproven and is neither practical nor sustainable to use. Today, FC is viewed even by proponents as a quote unquote technique of last resort and parents motivated by the siren song of 100% success rates abandon evidence-based methods in lieu of this pseudoscientific practice. I'm not qualified to recommend communication treatments, but I do wanna talk about augmentative and alternative communication or AAC for just a second. To be recognized as a legitimate form of AAC, the method or technique must enable the individual with disabilities to communicate independently, that is without interference from an assistant. In an effort to lend legitimacy to the technique, proponents refer to FC as AAC, but FC is a facilitator controlled technique, meaning that without the facilitator, the sophisticated written language output is virtually non-existent. It cannot be and is not recognized as a legitimate form of augmentative and alternative communication. Proponents of FC make the unfounded claim that autism is a motor problem, motor planning problem. In actuality, many people with autism have the fine and gross motor skills to type, but even if they didn't, low and high tech AAC devices can be adapted for physical impairments. An individual need only be able to blink an eye or twitch a muscle to communicate independently. 
AAC devices provide the assistance that proponents claim can only be achieved with physical human touch. Here's an example of eye tracking technology. You'll notice in this image that the screen is on a stand. This eliminates the problem of interference by the assistant in terms of keeping the screen completely still. With eye tracking, the computer picks up eye movements and initiates an action on the screen. To use eye tracking, individuals need to have an awareness that their eye gaze is causing a change on the screen. They also need to be able to track movement, sustain it, and in case of typing, have language and literacy skills that allow them to interact with the device to produce written language. In this image, the student is using eye gazing uh, technology to play music. This is an eye gazing program for literacy skills. The red outline indicates where the individual is looking and the letter registers in the white box at the top to record the words being spelled out. Now I picked eye tracking as a form of AAC to show you because proponents recently came out with a study to quote unquote prove FC works using eye tracking. What they downplay in the study is that the assistant was holding the letter board during the testing. This is problematic because small movements of the board by the facilitator can alter the angle of the screen and distort the eye tracking system itself. The individual, for example, might be intending to select the letter J on the letter board, but the computer might register the letter M because the board is tilted. The assistant in the study was also not blinded to test protocols, which raises questions of facilitator influence caused by inadvertently moving the board to more accurately spell out the responses to test questions. The study results would have been much more reliable had the researchers used a stand to keep the letter board still and blinded the assistant to test protocols to eliminate the question of facilitator influence. FC now has several variants. All forms of facilitated communication rely heavily on facilitator influence to work. Here the facilitator is using hand over hand to guide the typing. Very little pressure is needed to influence the movements. The facilitator here is holding on to her son's back. You can't tell from the still image, but her fingers constantly move. These small movements control what part of the keyboard her son points to, left or right, and changes in pressure also signal him to move his finger down to press a letter or up to wait for the next prompt. This cueing can be explained by the idiomotor phenomenon or non-conscious muscle movements, more commonly associated with using a pendulum or moving a planchette on a, a Ouija board. These cues can be subtle. Often the facilitators are unaware of the extent to which they're controlling the messages. Here the facilitator holds on to the individual individual's sleeve while they type together. Facilitators believe that fading support from the wrist to the shoulder or sleeve means they're not controlling the typing. However, remove the facilitator's hand and the sophisticated written output all but vanishes. While the stated goal of, of FC is to fade support completely so the person with disabilities can type without a facilitator present, proponents have yet to prove this actually can be done. Facilitators have to be within close physical, auditory, and visual range at all times for FC to quote unquote work. This is a form of facilitated communication known as rapid prompting method or spelling to communicate. In this variation of FC, the facilitator holds the letter board in the air while the person with disabilities points to the letters. Cueing occurs as the facilitator moves the board backwards and forwards, up and down to meet the individual's outstretched finger, or in this case, pencil. Here, the facilitator also restrain, restrains the person at the shoulder. Facilitators deny moving the board, claiming they can hold it absolutely still, but they're too distracted by asking and answering questions to be fully aware of their own body movements. And this is a hybrid form of facilitation that claims to use eye tracking. It requires two facilitators plus the person with disabilities. Here the mom holds her son in her lap while another facilitator purportedly tracks the eye gaze of the young man and points to where he's looking on a chart she's holding in the air. 
the mom reads off the letters and this form of communication requires eye gazing abilities from all three participants and at a distance. The board's held in the air so the facilitator has an added problem of inadvertent movement as does the mom who moves her son's head and neck throughout the session. Eye gazing technology with a computer on a stand would simplify this complex triad and eliminate the question of uh, facilitator influence. Another problem with FC in all its forms is that often the person with disabilities is not looking at the letter board during the typing sessions. Here, Douglas Bicklin and one of his trained facilitators interact with the keyboard while the individual with disabilities is looking away from the board and stimming. Ironically, this is an official training video and even their proponents were unable to follow their own guidelines. Here, master trainer Harvey Lavoie is fixated on the keyboard while his client, Tracy Thresher, has his eyes closed. The facilitator's grip indicates a lot of pressure on his client's arm and raises the question of who's actually doing the typing. This slide is from a group called Saved by Typing, and in the video, none of the clients are looking at the keyboards, though the facilitators are fixated on them. None of the facilitators correct this poor technique in their fellow facilitators and practicing a faulty technique incorrectly for long periods of time does not make the technique any more effective. Here's an example of rapid prompting method where the facilitators hold the board in the air while the individual with disabilities points to letters or at least stretches his finger in the general vicinity of the board. Facilitator movement and cueing is an issue and the translucent letter board here also allowed us to slow down the video and see that the person with disabilities often pointed in between letters with no distinct choice. The facilitator called out the names of letters that she thought fit with the words being spelled regardless of what part of the letter board was um, being touched. Another problem is that individuals with disabilities develop an unhealthy reliance on facilitators. This is Soma, founder of RPM, working out with a, a client. And Soma holds the board in the air and controls the interaction. At no time does she ask her client to confirm the, the words being spelled out or make corrections when the individual is looking, not looking at the board while typing. And this is a common practice for facilitators. Samantha, in this case, has the ability to recognize and verbally name letters, though whether she understands the words she's spelling is up for debate. Samantha constantly looks to Soma for confirmation. This is exactly backwards. In legitimate forms of AAC, it's the assistant who stops frequently and checks in with the client to make sure that what's being typed, or in the case of eye gazing, what's selected on the screen is what the individual actually intended. Even non-speaking individuals can confirm accurately um, the accuracy of the information by blinking or raising a hand to indicate that the information is correct. In Soma's case, she could simply ask the student to verbally say what word is being spelled. The person here had, had verbal skills. As an aside, twice during the session, Samantha says the end and once says time as she grabs the timer and breaks free from the corner she's in, indicating that she would like to stop the activity, but her spoken and nonverbal behaviors are completely ignored, um, which is also a common characteristic of facilitated communication. I've used slides from ProFC films and YouTube videos to demonstrate that even with facilitators who invented FC and, who, and those trained directly by them, problems with the technique still exist. Facilitator control over the board and the movements of their clients, conscious or non-conscious cueing, the absence of fading, the downplaying or ignoring of client verbal and non-verbal feedback all create a situ situation for individuals with disabilities that serves to suppress their communication abilities, not free them from their silence. Many of these individuals cry out or push against their facilitator. They bolt away from the situation, cover their eyes, bite themselves or try to bite their facilitator, or simply look away while the facilitator continues to call out letters on the board. The question has to be asked, what benefit is FC to individuals with disabilities when, in the absence of proof that FC messages are anything but facilitator controlled, the words are not their own? Proponents claim FC-generated messages are quote-unquote independent, 
while all the while aggressively denying the scientific evidence and avoiding testing for authorship. They claim that controlled testing is somehow demeaning to individuals with disabilities or much too stressful. These same individuals using facilitated communication have presented at the United Nations for Autism Awareness Day, graduated from college, written books, produced movies, and in some cases made false allegations of abuse claims against their family members. You'd think that answering a few questions that the individual with disabilities knows the answers to, but the facilitator does not, would be less stressful than those activities I just listed. Proponents use anecdotes to back up their claims, test protocols that include facilitators in developing the activities which negates the effect of blinded testing, or focus on the analysis of the written output. It's impossible to determine the separate contributions of the facilitator or the person with disabilities as they type together without controls in place, and analyzing only the written output fails to address the issue of independent authorship. The evidence against FC is so clear that many major health education and advocacy organizations have positions opposing the use of facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. American Speech Language Hearing Association, Association for Science and Autism Treatment, International Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication, most of the behavioral analysis organizations worldwide, and the American Psychological Association are just some of the organizations in opposition to this technique. However, Syracuse University, University of Northern Iowa, University of Virginia, Growing Kids Therapy Center, HALO, and some of the designated agencies in Vermont continue to be leaders in the promotion of FC and RPM. Oberlin College, Whittier College, University of Pennsylvania, University of Vermont, and others have allowed individuals using FC and RPM to take classes and in some cases graduate from their universities despite the fact that it's impossible to tell who's actually completing the coursework when FC is in use, the facilitator, or the person with disabilities. In California, the following organizations have staff or direct programs that support FC, Cal Lutheran, Chapman University, California State University, Los Angeles, Whittier Area Parents Association for Developmentally Handicapped, Greater Long Beach San Gabriel Chapter of the Autism Society of America, HANDLE, which is the Holistic Approach for Neurodevelopment and Learning Efficiency, and Saved by Typing. I counted six of Syracuse University's quote unquote master trainers working in the state, and there may be others. Instead of addressing critics' concerns or stopping the practice altogether, proponents have employed some tricks to um, deflect attention away from the scientific evidence. In 2010, Syracuse University, for example, changed the name of Facilitated Communication Institute to the Institute on Community Inclusion to, quote unquote, fly under the radar. Proponents changed the name of the practice from facilitated communication to supported typing, typing to communicate, spelling to communicate, rapid prompting method, method among others, and urged proponents to use these alternative names on individual education plans to get these discredited practices into the school systems, and in some states like Vermont, receive Medicaid reimbursements. They've renamed themselves as well, support assistant, interpreter, communication uh, com assistant and communications and regulations partner. Increasingly, it's necessary to analyze the assistant's behavior during the typing sessions to determine whether facilitated communication is being used, regardless of what name the assistant goes by. Proponents make good use of credulous reporters who want to deliver a feel-good miracle story to their audience. This was an effective tool proponents used in the early 1990s to spread the word about FC. Now it's being used to promote supported typing, spelling to communicate, and rapid prompting method. In December 2019, reporter Miranda Meister wrote an article titled, After Years with No Way to Communicate, Newberg teen finds her voice. The story featured a young woman, woman using quote-unquote motor communication, aka AFC, and an Indiana news station aired the story promoting it as a quote, new form of communication, unquote. In January of 2020, 
Uh, reporter Marie Fazio wrote an article for the Chicago Tribune titled 17 year old Highland Park boy with nonverbal autism blogs to reach others like him. People need to stop underestimating us. And this article touted the benefits of rapid prompting method without mentioning that proponents have failed to provide evidence that RPM produces communications independent, independent of facilitator influence. Had either of these reporters done a simple Google search, they would have had access to the FC and RPM Wikipedia pages, which have been updated by Susan Gerbic's GSOW team of editors and includes a list of evidence-based references readily available for further investigation. The Washington Post responded slightly more responsibly when pressured in October 2020 by putting an editor's note about the dangers of FC and RPM on the article they featured called What We Can Learn About This COVID-19 Time from Non-Speaking Autistic Teen. However, since FC and RPM are unproven communication techniques, any advice that is given in this article should be taken with a grain of salt. These are the thoughts of the facilitators, not the person with disabilities. A couple weeks ago, the Tampa Bay Times published an article titled Grace is 14, Autistic and Smarter Than Anyone Knew, featuring spelling to communicate. The young woman has been using the letter board for several years and according to facilitated messages, has aspirations to study internal medicine at Harvard Medical School. The Asha quote about FC's lack of scientific validity was there, but it was sandwiched between paragraphs of how great this form of communication is. We're also seeing a number of books and movies purportedly written by individuals with profound communication difficulties, all using facilitated communication or one of its variants. Deej, Autism is a World, Wretches and Jabbers, Far From the Tree, A Mother's Courage, and The Reason I Jump are receiving international attention, but all portray an uncritical look at FC and RPM. When in October 2020, the Delcon Times published an article featuring a young man with autism who had purportedly written a book using a form of FC known as spelling to communicate, we wrote a letter of concern to the reporter, editor, and publisher about the promotion of this discredited technique and provided references and organizations opposing FC and RPM. We received the following reply. The Daily Times is not a scientific journal. We have no interest in getting involved with this controversy. The paper's stance appears to be in favor of ignoring the expertise of professionals who have dedicated their lives to develop evidence-based methods and communication devices that enable people with disabilities to communicate independently and without the interference of a facilitator. Articles like these are part of the reason why FC and RPM still exist today, despite the overwhelming evidence of facilitator authorship. I understand that feel good miracle stories sell, but newspapers who promote FC and RPM are complicit in spreading misinformation when reporters fail to do their due diligence. It puts the newspapers in a difficult position when faced with disconfirming evidence after stories like these are published, but nevertheless, the media needs to be held to a higher standard than the pub general public when it comes to reporting the facts. This rejection of expert advice and scientific evidence is not uncommon or limited to the media. People who already believe in FC and RPM seem to go deeper into their belief systems in the face of evidence. People who criticize the technique of FC are often characterized as being against people with disabilities, including people with disabilities, by the way, who oppose FC and advocate for evidence-based measures. We want to ensure that individuals with disabilities are not being exploited and that the communications, however they are generated, are not their own, are their own and not those of well-meaning but misguided facilitators. Proponents push back by asking critics to provide an alternative form of communication, but since proponents largely reject current proven methods and techniques, this is a moot point. Frankly, there is no substitute for a technique in which the facilitator is the primary communicator. However, I do believe that our society fail, falls short of providing appropriate health, education, and other support to all individuals with disabilities and their families, leaving room for pseudoscientific techniques like facilitated communication to exist. We still have a long way to go in the acceptance and inclusion of individuals with disabilities and those with complex communication needs. 
In closing, I've given you an overview of facilitated communication. It's not an exaggeration to say that the FC community has failed to provide an, any reliable evidence to date to prove their claims of independent communication. Even Douglas Bicklin in, two, in a 2002 court case testified that facilitator influence may affect anywhere from 20 to 40% of users. If so, which 60 to 80% are we to believe? I wonder too about his plan to quote unquote deal with it because the only reliable way to identify facilitator influence, double blind testing, or at least blinded testing is aggressively rejected by proponents. We're supposed to believe FC works because people using FC say it works, and we owe it to individuals with profound communication difficulties to push back against these unfounded claims. Um, if you're interested in more information, Susan Gerbic and I have recorded a series of YouTube interviews about facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. These can be found on her About Time YouTube channel or check out the FC and RPM Wikipedia pages. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it and I look forward to your questions. Wow, 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 wow. I'm telling you. We're kicking over here. <laughs> I wish I could just keep these spot, keep it going for another hour here. The questions that are coming in highly for you, Janice, and people are pissed every time. <laughs> every time you talk, the 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 questions people watching are like, "What? Wait, yeah. wait, what? Wait, what?" <laughs> Either they yeah. say, as we always hear, "Oh, I thought this went away years ago," or "You got to be kidding me." What? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was a facilitator in the early 1990s when this first came out, and my story's a long one, so I won't go into it here, but I came to the scientific side, and I had no idea it would still be, we'd still be talking about this 30 years later. It's ridiculous. There just is no, it's one of those things, there is no proof um, of anything except that it's the facilitators doing it. Right, right. Getting. So I did post a link that Stuart uh, Vice had written for Skeptical Inquirer, an interview with you that tells your personal story. I put it in the chat earlier. Please, you guys, when you get a time, not during the next talk or, or anything like that, but please take a chance and read this because it talks about Janice's personal story with facilitated communication. She's not just talking about this stuff because she just happened to do some research on it. She's lived this life and it is uh, quite insightful. I... I uh, a couple points I want to make before we get to a couple questions. So hopefully we can get to this. I want to get to <laughs> <laughs> Somebody mute the dog. I know it's, no, it's not Jackie this time. Okay. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, to be really, really clear, um, FC and RPM remove the voice of the person with uh, a communication problems. This is not giving voice to somebody, which is what a lot of the feel good articles in the newspapers say. They are removing their voice and replacing it with a facilitator who says they're speaking. The, anyway, it's this big giant circle. So I wanna be clear about that. The other thing I wanna be clear about is that the screenshots that you're viewing, the, that you guys all saw, and the videos that are being put out that you can watch, just go put facilitated communication or rapid prompting method or spelling to communicate into YouTube. And you'll find these videos. These are videos put up by people who believe FC works. Yes. This is not something that we've put some hidden camera in and, and shown it. You clearly watch the person not looking at the keyboard or letter board looking off to the side, some of them trying to get away as somebody's still grabbing their hand, they are, um, it's, it's, it's beyond obvious that they are, that the facilitator is very carefully concentrating on what's being put in the keyboard. And the, and on many times the person who's using the keyboard is not looking at it. And, and then I want to mention real quick, GSOW seems to be very prominent in this um, skeptic camp today, and that's fine <laughs> because it's activism. And we have written the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication, as well as the uh, Wikipedia page for rapid prompting method and other pages. And we've also had some deleted. And I wanted to note that 
uh, since we put the facilitated communication Wikipedia page up, it's already been viewed 318,000 times. And the RPM Wikipedia page has already been viewed 48,000 times. So we are doing a lot to reach out to people, even inoculate them. Yeah, okay, we're, so meeting, we're meeting people who, um, because facilitated communication is a little bit easier to recognize the facilitator influence than rapid prompting method. Um, we're getting people now that are saying they don't believe in FC, but they believe in rapid prompting methods. Yes. So we still have a lot of education to a do. A lot to go. And I think educating you guys here on this uh, Zoom call and YouTube, as well as the people who are going to watch us later, I think this is really the really important because you guys understand the scientific method, you understand the stuff, and, and for you to be able to say, wait a minute, I think this is being done in my school, or my neighbor has a kid that is starting to get involved in this, or I think helping educate you guys to even know that it's still a thing is, is the first thing. Yeah, the other thing I, I didn't mention much about is that FC really is a belief system. It's a, it's based on what the facilitator believes. So education is really important before people um, go down that road, because once they believe it works, quote unquote works, it's really difficult to get people to, it's a big psychological ask to give pe get people to give it up once they've, right. when, once they've um, bought into it. We're inoculating you guys, and we need you to inoculate the rest of the population so that if they do start to see that this is happening or suggested to them, they'll, they'll be able to say, wait a minute, well, I think there might be some other path. Okay, so one of the questions from Carmen, um, I'm sure it's probably from many people, is how do the facilitators justify the fact that the client is not looking at the board? Yeah, they, um, first of all, they're mostly focused focused on the board, so they may not even notice that the person is not looking, but also they're trained, especially in rapid prompting method, that they supposedly can, um, are only auditory learners, they're not they're not visual learners, so they, they can hear the difference in letters somehow by the, the sounds of the, the tapping or whatever I don't, I'm not really clear on all that it doesn't make any sense but that's what they're taught they're, the parents are taught in the workshops that they're because because they're auditory learners they don't have to look at the keyboard that it's it's peripheral vision or they you know whatever they're picking up auditory cues or whatever it doesn't make sense but the facilitators are the the facilitators are asking and are answering the questions and calling out letters so they are much more engaged in that than they are at actually looking at the client that they're working with mostly uh, they don't they don't notice and one time i remember you talking about somebody who's blind who's communicating yeah yeah there's a the the there's um there's a controlled test that was done by somebody who was legally blind that supposedly could use facilitated communication. Right. They did a controlled testing and found out, no, actually the person wasn't able to, but. I'd like to see somebody type in the air, holding their hand up at the air with no way of connecting their wrist to the, I don't know. Okay, a couple other questions. Janine says that um, in the 1990s, FC linked with false memory and false accusations of sexual abuse. Currently, is there any linkage of FC with other pseudosciences? Um, I, there are, with facilitated communication in particular, the traditional hand-holding um, rather than rapid prompting method, for some reason there's there are more false allegations of abuse cases. Um, I don't know if there's a, I don't, that's a tricky one. I don't necessarily believe it's the facilitator manufacturing their own story, but I think they're reacting to a situation. So, for example, if they if they suspected that they teach it in the workshops that people with autism or disabilities might disclose um, abuse cases. And um, so you're sort of primed for it. And if the facilitator believes that that's true, then eventually it's gonna come out in the interactions on, on the written page. Um, so I think they're, they're, they're I don't know if there's any been any studies that link the two together, but I think that there's that fabrication of abuse is um, a, a theme that runs in, in both of those. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, from Linda Rosa, who always makes eloquent questions. Um, can you say something about the federally funded center planned at Syracuse? Oh, I, 
I actually haven't looked had time to look into that, but um, maybe Linda, actually, you can you can speak to that because I I um, got sidetracked on another project and I meant to look at it, but they I, I believe that Syri the the Syracuse is the ground zero for FC in the United States, and they started a facilitated mm -hmm. communication institute, and then they changed it to the community inclusion, and now they're they're doing a federally funded program. Is that what you understand, um, Linda? Uh, yes, I guess it's uh, federally fun going to be federally funded and also with donations. Uh, perhaps the university itself is involved in the funding, but uh, I think that's an area where uh, skeptic activists can uh, step in and demand that public funds not be used in, uh, for uh, pseudoscience. Hopefully with the new administration. Absolutely, yeah. That's <laughs> Perhaps we can uh, join in with uh, some of the skeptics at the student newspaper at Syracuse and uh, create a project there. Yeah, that's a really good idea. The, the student newspaper in 2016 actually came out. Michael Burke was the reporter, the student reporter there, and he actually did an expose about um, Syracuse University and facilitated communication and they ended up the paper itself ended up denouncing facilitated communication so that was really a big deal at the time and perhaps they would be willing to continue um, working along those lines i know michael's not there anymore but there may be some others that right. yep so from deborah are there any efforts underway to have our representatives write laws or regulations around this um not that I know of, but if you if you know how to go that route, um, please contact me because we're always looking for ways to to up until like three or four years ago, there were um, like worldwide, there were individuals working on this problem, but um, slowly we've been able to start like connecting all those people together. So we're always looking for for individuals that we don't have on our team yet. Um, and, and that's one area that we're we, right. we don't. So I'm going to sneak in one more question that you can answer really quickly from Kevin Mocker. Does it ever work? Ever? No. No. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it, it only, it, 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 the, the proponents have test um, studies that they claim say it works, but the facilitators were involved in developing the test protocols. So they weren't blinded to the information. So they, they, you, you can't, those tests don't, don't mean anything every time. And it's been hundreds of people that have been tested every, and it didn't matter whether they came from Syracuse university or took a one or two day workshop. The, the amount of training does not matter. These people were, were, um, tested and every time there's controls put in place, it's it comes out that the facilitator is the one that's doing the communicating every single time absolutely so i'm gonna have to cut us off i i hate to because this has been so interesting i get my blood pressure going up every time um i have to mention that there are some fantastic links that are put in the chat uh, people probably, I know you don't have time to investigate these links right now, but why don't you take them and put them on a Word document or something so that you can look at them later. There are some fabulous um, different uh, articles, uh, even James Randi, uh, Richard Saunders put up the link to James Randi talking about it. James Randi was obviously uh, very involved in this and he was a friend of uh, Janice's and, and uh, they've communicated over the years over this. And also, um, we have a series, as you said, on uh, on the YouTube channel that I hope you guys are all going over there and subscribing to. There's a huge amount of conversations between you and I about this, and we discuss a lot of facilitated communication questions and examples. We show videos and all kinds of stuff that they can get to. And one of the things that Lisa said that I am right on is that I see a huge parallel between facilitated communication and the psychic world. Yes. And it is there, and I think there's a lot of links. So I hate to do this, but I have to Susan, say... Susan, just so everyone knows, there's three yeah. little dots at the bottom of a chat, at least on a PC, and it allows you to save the entire chat at one time. Thank you, Rob. Excellent. I'm surprised Adrian didn't jump in with that first. Yeah. <laughs> I, just so, put oh, my, yeah. I just put my email 
in know. there in the chat. So if anybody wanted to get in touch right. with me afterwards, and, uh, Brian there. Kirby has done a nice interview with her as well. There's so much great information out there. Save the chat so you guys can look at these links later because we've got some really fantastic speakers still more to come. So you're not going to have time to do it right now. But um, we do have a project called True Voices, and we have been stumbling through and having some success. Uh, bits and pieces of trying to get a handle on how best to handle this, but there's no magic pill for us to be able to solve this problem. But I think the first step is just getting that Wikipedia okay. pages out there, yep. meeting each other is really important, and then educating and inoculating society as best we can, and then we'll move forward as we with the other projects we have planned. And Janice, thank you so much for doing this today. I thank really you. Appreciate I appreciate it. the time. Thank it's you. Always so inspired listening to you. And like I said, it always gets my heart going. <laughs> Mine too. The <laughs> topic is like. <laughs> yeah. So, someday I look forward to just writing about kittens and puppy dogs. <laughs> All right, you guys. Okay. Thank so you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks for that. Uh, did I hear Deborah say something? I just said thank you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I, pre <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. That is great. Okay, you guys. I'm telling you, this, this is a full day of all kinds of amazing stuff. Every speaker you're going to have, you're going to go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I can't believe I waited. I, I didn't realize about that. Oh, I got to hear this next thing. <laughs>